Good morning. I'm Tim Wickberg. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for SCEDMD. I'm here to present the current version of our roadmap. Uh, but first, thank you guys for uh, participating in the Slurm User Group Meeting 2020. Uh, sad we can't be live in person at Harvard this year, but uh, we're making the best of what we can. So the agenda, we are at the last presentation of today. Um, hopefully you guys have tuned into the prior three presentations. Those will remain online as the pre-record versions uh, for the next week or so. And they're all uh, intentionally split up into separate presentations um, for ease of logistics on the back end here. Um, they're all linked through our SkinMD Slurm YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C slash SkinMD Slurm. Uh, and there are direct links to each of the videos available on the agenda as well. Feel free to ask questions throughout through the YouTube chat. Uh, we will be moderating it. Uh, questions are going to be relayed to me uh, by the moderators. Some of these questions we may hold till the end. We have about 20, 30 minutes actually dedicated for a open Q&A forum. Uh, if I don't get to the questions during the presentation, I will try to cover them there. Um, note that there's about a five second broadcast delay. Um, so by the time you ask the question, I'm already in the future. Um, so uh, please be prepared for a little bit of lag there. So my presentation today is Slurm 2011 and beyond um, doing the standard SCEDMD roadmap. Uh, Slurm releases 2002 came out in February 2011 is coming out this November and then the next one past that will be 2108 in August 2021. Slurm major releases come out every nine months. The major release numbers are the two digit year, a period, and the two digit month. So Slurm 20.02 uh, was released in 2020 and in February. Uh, please note that the Slurm release, you do need both parts there. There is no Slurm 20 release, as I've heard people refer to it. There are actually going to be two different releases in 2020, both the 20.02 release and the 20.11 release coming up in November. Maintenance releases, such as the recently released 20.02.5, come out about monthly uh, for the most major, uh, most recent major release. And SCEDMD supports the two most recent major releases. This is currently 2002 and 1905. So uh, I'm actually going to go back into the past a little bit. Uh, since last slug, we actually released Slurm 20.02 itself. Uh, so I want to do a recap of stuff that is available in that release. So first, uh, the REST API is, is one of our biggest uh, and most exciting projects. Um, Nate just presented on a lot of different aspects of that. Um, the initial version is really designed to interact with the most common Slurm controller pieces. Alongside that came this idea of the auth alt types, which is to allow the Slurm controller to talk multiple different authentication protocols simultaneously. In the past, Slurm has always been restricted to just talking one style of authentication. This auth alt type lets you stack up multiple ways of authenticating, which makes it easier for us to interact with the REST API through these JWT uh, authentication tokens. There's also a new command that comes in alongside this when you enable this auth alt type for JWT called sControl token, which allows the user to request a JWT token for themselves. We also introduced this idea of the configless Slurm. Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer. There is certainly still a configuration file for Slurm. This is just meant to highlight that the compute nodes in your cluster don't need to directly manage a local copy of this file, but instead can fetch it from the Slurm controller operating in your system. So you can automatically have this happen if you set up the appropriate DNS SRV records. Uh, there's also a command line option to the Slurm D process. Uh, which will let you set that up if you don't have access to modify the DNS records directly. Jason Booth covered this in extensive detail this morning in the Field Notes 4 presentation. I'd encourage you to refer to that uh, or refer to the slides, which we'll have online in the next day or two. Uh, we did add support for the sites that are using this WC key feature, the idea of retroactively changing them in your accounting database and having that update all the relevant S report reports. Uh, this goes through the S account manager update command. Um, so you can change that. It'll update all the relevant reports and re-roll the past usage uh, to reflect that change in the WC key. 
We updated the oversubscribe exclusive definition. Um, in the past, this would assign all the CPUs and memory, but it would not assign all of the other TREs, most specifically the GPUs, that uh, come along with that node to that job. Um, so we made this change so that the accounting reflects that they are blocking and using up access to everything in the node, not just the CPUs uh, and optionally the memory. We removed this long misunderstood fast schedule option. Um, the, the fast schedule option itself had only a vague impact on the performance of the scheduler uh, and had a very confusing set of options of zero, one, and two. Uh, two as fast schedule did not actually make anything faster. It just let you lie to Slurm about the actual hardware configuration on each of your compute nodes. Uh, and we found a lot of sites that inadvertently misconfigured this. Um, also, the fast schedule zero behavior was causing a lot of problems with some newer modifications and did not work quite right. We've retired all of this. The fast schedule two behavior, if you're setting up a test and development environment, does remain, but it has moved over to this SlurmD parameter config overrides option instead. And we still do not recommend doing that on a production system. Uh, I do see in the chat people are asking where my hat is. Uh, when I get to a break, I will go fetch my fedora. My fedora is not actually green, it is blue. Um, or at least the, the one I am usually wearing at Slug is blue. I'll go dig it out later. Uh, but it will affect the lighting a little bit in here. Uh, so I'm, I'm not wearing it today. On to burst buffer data warp. Uh, so the burst buffer data warp interface, uh, we had a request to add some of the percent substitution characters that you've long been able to use for the standard out, standard air, standard in file name patterns within Slurm. Um, this makes it a little bit easier for sites that are using burst buffer um, to swap in the job ID, the job array ID, um, username, and some other details into file name patterns in there automatically just so you can have a consistent submit script, um, but have the output files moved around to a directory that matches up to details of that specific submission. We also refactored the prologue and the epilogue interface. Um, this has long been the interface where we will just launch a provided shell script or binary if set as the prologue, the epilogue, the prologue slurm control D or the epilogue slurm control D. We've refactored the internals and introduced this new prep plugin interface that you as the end site can develop against. Um, we still obviously support the prologue, the epilogue, the prologue slurm control D and the epilogue slurm control D scripts through a new prep slash script plugin, which is enabled by default. But this allows sites that are doing custom development easier access to some of the internal details of that job it also avoids having to do additional fork and exec steps as part of job launch, um, which for the Prolog Slurm Control D can be a performance bottleneck for higher throughput systems. We made it one key adjustment as well to how Slurm's libpmi library has been shipped. Um, we did this to avoid a direct dependency between libpmi and libslurm for a specific Slurm release version. Um, what we found was that OpenMPI prefers to statically link itself. If OpenMPI statically linked to libpmi as provided by Slurm on your system, this meant that your OpenMPI install inherits a direct dependency on that libslurm specific to the release that you compiled against. Um, this obviously causes a lot of problems during Slurm upgrades when MPI unexpectedly can't find this older library version that it was directly linked against. We've worked around this by introducing a new unversioned library in the dependency chain that avoids this whole link. Um, so that going forward from 2002, you should not have these problems on a Slurm version upgrade with your open MPI stack uh, breaking. Um, Ryan, I do see in the chat you're asking about how the presentation works. Um, if you want to ask that again at the end, I'm happy to give you a very concise overview of how these presentations have worked today. 
One other thing that we did add uh, in 2002 is this new node set syntax. Uh, this is something we actually invented somewhat on the fly at the last Slurm user group meeting, um, where you can define a node set, which is just a name for a grouping of nodes that are defined either as a static list of nodes or a set of nodes sharing a common feature. If you define this in your Slurm configuration, you can use this node set name instead of a massive list of node definitions as part of your partition definitions later on, uh, which can help you avoid having to copy and paste stuff. Especially if you have more of a condo style cluster, um, you may end up with massive blocks of mostly repeated node definitions. This can help you avoid that. As an example, just of the syntax here, um, we're defining three different groups of nodes, node one to five, six to 10, 11 to 15. Each of them with slightly different features turned on. Uh, one to five has QDR and a V100 card defined for it. Uh, six to 10 has a QDR card, and then 11 to 15 has a hypothetical NDR card for whenever they get that far in the alphabet. So you can define these node sets. So I defined one as V100 nodes that will automatically be populated with every node that has a V100 feature defined for it. At that point, I can define my partitions just to have this V100 uh, and greatly simplify the uh, configuration syntax further on. We also added this idea of a magnetic reservation. Um, I, I will note this was originally referred to as a promiscuous reservation uh, for the 2002.0 through 2002.3 point releases. Um, we did have some concerns with the nomenclature we had picked. So these have been redefined as magnetic reservations um, and that older term is no longer used in the SLRM source code. The idea though behind these magnetic reservations is for a reservation that a job would otherwise be eligible to run in if the user had specified dash dash reservation equals whatever, it allows them to just submit the job and not worry about that specific reservation, but a reservation with this magnetic flag defined will automatically try to import jobs and attract jobs to it and start and launch those jobs if there are resources available in that reservation. Jobs that are submitted are still eligible to run outside of the reservation, but they'll automatically also be adopted into the reservation if there are resources available. So that is the 2002 roadmap here. Um, I'm just taking a brief pause to check for any questions I haven't gotten to on 2002 in particular. Um, as to the, def the, the difference between a node set and a partition, the node sets themselves are designed to be used for the partition definitions. Um, this example, I don't really repeat sort of more condo style definitions um, where you've got partition one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all with mostly equivalent sets of nodes, but maybe missing one or two here and there. The idea is to give you a way, a shorthand way just to refer to a large collection of nodes without having to copy and paste the full list of nodes out that you would otherwise. Let's see, I'm seeing questions on reservations here. For magnetic reservations, can a user avoid them? Uh, no, not at this time. If you have turned on a magnetic reservation, uh, that user's jobs are eligible to run in there if they otherwise satisfy the access control constraints. Okay, I'm gonna take a brief pause here and then move into Slurm 2011. So, Slurm 2011 roadmap coming out in November. Uh, the REST API, as Nate talked about this morning, um, we're extending it to not just cover the common Slurm controller interactions, but also start covering some of the more common Slurm database interactions. Uh, most critically, giving you a nice convenient interface to accounting records within the system uh, in a format that should prove a little easier to, in to ingest into other systems. Um, my hope is longer term, you'll see projects uh, such as uh, uh, OpenXD mod potentially move to using this as the interface to grabbing accounting data rather than trying to scrape stuff through S account directly. 
IPv6. Uh, we had some questions on this earlier. Slurm RESTD today supports IPv6, but we are going to extend IPv6 support to Slurm as a whole. For the 2011 release, we are going to require you to specifically turn on dual stack support through a communication parameter uh, that we will be adding uh, shortly. The reason we are rolling this out slowly is we are expecting at least some sites are going to run into problems running Slurm in a dual stack environment, um, especially potentially around DNS misconfigurations, especially on the V6 side. So we're not immediately switching Slurm to a dual stack model, but longer term we do expect to change it. So by default, Slurm will run dual stack for your cluster. So Slurm 2108, potentially a later release at some point, we will make that change to enable dual stack automatically. There will be an option at that point to explicitly force IPv4 only operation if you would prefer Slurm not run dual stack. Uh, one other minor thing we added here is MariaDB SSL connection support um, for sites that are concerned about encrypting the connection between the Slurm DVD and the MySQL slash MariaDB database. Uh, there are now options to enable this. Uh, please see the storage parameters option in the Slurm DVD man page for the configuration for this. Uh, one thing that we've done that, that sounds very simple uh, when, when we talk about it, but actually requires a lot of internal complexity is this new idea of a heterogeneous job step. Um, hopefully you're familiar with the idea of a heterogeneous job already in Slurm. The step is to some extent a simplification of that model, letting you use srun to build a step out of different components and have them all launch within a single MPI communicator, uh, within sort of a single more vanilla style job that's just requesting sort of equivalent nodes rather than disparate groups of nodes uh, like you would with the heterogeneous jobs themselves. Uh, so the syntax with this looks pretty simple. Um, as a very trivial example, um, I'm running through with SALEC requesting two nodes, uh, exclusive access to them just to make sure I get full access to those nodes. And then within my allocation, I'm using srun to launch a heterogeneous step. Um, in my extremely trivial example, I'm launching echo A as part of the first component and then echo B as part of the second component. So you can see A and B came out of just this one srun invocation. Um, so it does overlap a bit with the existing MPMD support, um, but we find that this syntax should be a lot simpler and a lot more powerful going forward. Last command here on the, on the example is just an S account command showing that these heterogeneous steps um, share a lot in common with how we've previously done the accounting reporting for heterogeneous jobs with this plus syntax. So you can see my step zero here that I launched has a component zero and a component one. Uh, they both ran echo. Uh, but you can use this for uh, much more sophisticated uh, job style construction and launch. Um, I am seeing, and this is backtracking a little bit, I am seeing a comment around uh, US government requiring IPv6 only um, there's not actually a question behind that. Sorry. <laughs> Moving forward. Threads per core. Um, this is an option that's long existed and long been misunderstood in Slurm due to some limitations in its implementation. Threads per core prior to Slurm 20.11 only influenced how Slurm did the job allocation. It did not change how step launches actually happened. The change is to bring that into the step launch and actually influence how tasks are placed on your system. Uh, the motivating factor behind this is to more easily emulate um, how on Cray Alp systems, how the app run command has historically worked. So this is now used to influence the placement of your tasks, changes how the MPI process affinity will work binding stuff to your CPUs, um, it's constructed and does uh, sort of influence a couple of other internal settings like CPU bind threads. Um, it's very similar to the hint no multi-thread, except the hint no multi-thread did not work well for more than two threads per core. And we're seeing a lot of newer systems with four or more threads per core. 
So this threads per core is meant to patch up that job launch behavior. Uh, two quick examples here, max number of threads per core, uh, different ways of constructing your S run command to influence this uh, MPI rank layout. We're also in 2011, adding this idea of an interactive job step. So customers and sites that are moving from a lot of other workload managers are used to having an interactive mode where the user's terminal is immediately presented out on a compute node assigned to their job. Uh, and we've seen obviously a lot of requests to do this. For a long time, we've recommended sites use the sallic default command option to do this. Um, but this has always been a bit of a hack in how the sallic and slurms internals work. And it uses srun to launch what in the accounting is a normal job step and what for the step scheduler is also considered a normal job step, which consumes resources. Instead of all that complexity, we're gonna be adding a new flag to turn this on, where running with this means salloc will automatically move the terminal to the first node in a user's job allocation. That interactive step itself will exist in accounting as another specialized step, similar to how the batch and extern steps work today. And most crucially, it will not consume resources by default. The interactive step will be provided access to any of the GRES on the node, so the GPUs on the node especially, that that job wants access to but those will not be considered allocated for the purposes of successive step launches. So it should make workflows that involve, say, running salloc, doing some quick pre-processing that requires the GPU to be present and enabled, and then following that up with a larger MPI launch through SRUN. It should simplify that workflow considerably, simplify how this use shows up in your accounting records and clean up and tidy up a lot of other subtle details and edge cases that people have run into using this salloc default command in operation. Trez, uh, this is uh, a very succinct option here. We added this new end task per GPU option. Um, it will assign that many tasks per GPU in your job steps. Uh, for mail types, uh, we're adding a new mail type for invalid dependencies. Uh, for sites that have dependency parameters kill invalid depend turned on, uh, which is something we, we lightly recommend to a lot of sites so that if your users have built more complicated dependency chains, those jobs at least get flushed out uh, and the users aren't sitting there waiting and accumulating more junk jobs that are never going to run. If you've enabled that, uh, users would like to be able to get email just on that specific event, and this new mail type will cover that use. On to reservations. Uh, we've actually added and tweaked and modified a lot with Slurm's reservation subsystem based on different customer requests. Um, so there's a lot of little incremental changes here that I'm gonna go through pretty quickly. Um, first, uh, allowing users to delete reservations. So if you've set up and created a reservation for a specific user, um, they came, beat down your office door, or um, I, I suppose in these times, beat down your home office door, demanded that they had to use a reservation, and then changed their mind three hours later, this gives them the means to directly delete it themselves without having to bother you again. Um, it is an optional thing. It is not turned on by default. You need this new Slurm Control D parameters, user res delete, option and they are only allowed to delete a reservation if they would have been permitted to run within that reservation. Another new thing we are adding is this idea of multi-reservation job submissions. Today a job has to be submitted to zero or one reservation. With the idea of the magnetic reservations that we introduced in Slurm 2002, um, this got a little fuzzier where a job could be submitted to zero reservations, but there could be any number of magnetic reservations willing to adopt it. Uh, we've sort of extended a lot of the same scheduling concepts internally to the idea of just letting people submit to multiple reservations simultaneously. And whichever reservation the job manages to run in, it will run in that reservation. Um, so you just submit these as a comma separated list 
uh, much as you would a multi-partition submission today. Um, if you don't want your users to do this, um, we would recommend a job submit filter to filter these out and reject jobs that are, are trying to make use of this. Um, I am seeing there is a question here on allowing users to delete reservation, way to limit it so only a nominated user can delete them. Um, there is not currently a plan to extend the access controls behind each of the reservations to say which user owns it versus is allowed to run in it. Um, if that's something that's important for your use case, uh, we're happy to discuss extending that in a future release. Uh, moving on, uh, we've added this new allow groups access control on a reservation. Um, we've had this allow groups on the partition level for a long time. We're just bringing this into parity with the reservation subsystem. So it does permit access by a Unix group. Um, I will note, uh, since this comes up a lot when people are asking me why there is no deny groups setting in Slurm, um, we have in many production environments seen issues with LDAP, especially not reporting accurate group membership. Um, if your LDAP servers are overloaded, the underlying Unix system calls will just report that there are no users present in a group. So for Slurm, since we know that that is something that the subsystem may lie about and since the Unix subsystem reporting zero group members combined with a deny groups access control would mean all of a sudden anybody could sneak in even if you were trying to deny them access. We're not willing to implement a deny groups feature. We only use allow groups because the issue of a transient failure in LDAP uh, is a lot less harmful. People won't sneak in by accident. Uh, we'd rather have this fail secure rather than fail safe. Uh, one other thing, uh, we've added a new S control update mechanism. Um, if you've set up recurring reservations for your users and just want to skip one, um, say you know that next week is spring break and that the research group is not going to use that reservation that you've set up on a weekly basis for them, you can do this S control update reservation with the reservation name skip, and that will skip the next scheduled instance of that repeating reservation and just move it back to the next repeat interval. Um, let's see, just uh, Ryan Cox is asking a clarification question. So to be clear, can a reservation be deleted by any user ha or who has access or only if the reservation has one user allowed? If you have enabled this, it is off by default. If you have enabled this, any user that can submit and run in that reservation would be permitted to delete a given reservation. Um, I am seeing some other commentary here going, uh, seems like user res delete would be a better per reservation flag. Um, that may be an interesting extension of that. That is not something we are doing for the 2011 release, at least. Um, if you'd like to open a ticket with us, I'm, I'm happy to discuss that further. I do see that there could be some value in a per reservation way to control that access control. Uh, let's see. One other thing we're planning on adding, um, and I will be very curious to see the use cases behind this, um, but this is the idea of adding an scrontab command uh, that will be mostly compatible with the Unix crontab command. For this to work, we'll be supporting the idea of a recurring job in your cluster. Um, there will be options to disable this if, if it's not appropriate for your system. Uh, but the idea behind this is for a lot of especially larger scale systems, you may be letting your users run cron today on the login nodes. The problem with this is then it has trained your users to really care about a specific login node because that's where their cron tab lives. So this means that if login node two needs to be brought out of service for a while, you may have a half a dozen other login nodes that are accessible and available. You may be updating a DNS record for your login node pool to point them at that. But you have a set of your user population that probably cares way too much about the specific health of login node too. The idea here instead is to let users offload these recurring tasks into Slurm. Slurm will launch them as they normally would. 
we would encourage sites to set up some job submit filtering and some other options to place this class of work in a dedicated partition um, with some dedicated access control rules. But the idea is to let users interact with scrontab much as they would with crontab, place these recurring persistent jobs um, somewhere and have Slurm track and manage them for you. You may in fact want to set up your login nodes as if they were otherwise normal compute nodes in Slurm, just off in a dedicated login slash cron partition that only this class of job can run in. Uh, we're still working on a few of the implementation details around this, um, but we, we do see some interesting use cases arising out of this. One of the main things we'll be adding is support in SBatch for a cron pattern style syntax with all the different little percent signs and division signs that you've uh, learned to love with cron jobs. Um, one thing, and I will note that that sets this apart. Today, you can get users to do most of the same type of workload if you just have them submit a batch script that submits another iteration of that same batch script. We usually caution against that kind of workload um, as mistakes there can inadvertently hurt your entire cluster. Um, if whatever the processing element of a batch script that's going to submit another batch script is fails, but fails quickly, you may find yourself drowned in repeated submissions and repeated runs of that same batch script. So we'd rather give people kind of a more comfortable crontab-like format. Um, some more enterprising sites, you may even try symlinking your normal crontab to scrontab instead. Uh, but we're really curious to see what uh, what the use cases are. Um, and yes, I can confirm NERSC and Chris Samuel are the ones that are sponsoring this development effort. Um, so it is a lot tailored to their existing use cases today. Um, we're uh, certainly interested in potentially extending and, and modifying some of this behavior longer term. Okay, just take a brief pause here. On to uh, what, I, what I've lovingly started calling the Slurm 2011 anti-roadmap. Um, this builds off of an anti-roadmap I presented last year at uh, Slug 2019. Um, this one's a lot shorter than last year's. I've kind of caught up with a lot of technical debt Slurm has accrued over the years. There's not as many subsystems that I'm worried about retiring today. But one of the things that I'm very happy to announce actually is that we have finally retired the layout slash entity subsystem from Slurm that nobody was using and had no working examples. Um, this is something that we have been discussing doing for the past five years and we finally got around to do it. It is gone in the Slurm 2011 release. One other thing that we've discussed removing in the past um, because it has a lot or had a lot of architectural issues um, that prevented it from working on the very systems it was meant to help um, is the idea of message aggregation. Um, this was a subsystem where RPC messages from the SlurmD nodes on uh, the SlurmD process on your compute nodes would be aggregated locally at the SlurmD potentially relayed through another layer of SlurmD processes on other compute nodes, and then sent as one bulk RPC up to the Slurm controller. Um, in practice, we ran into a lot of problems on these larger scale systems that can most benefit from this model where messages would get lost in flight. If a compute node crashed, it may crash and lose not just its own messages, but any messages it was in charge of relaying which would lead to stuck jobs on your system and compute nodes that seem to be unresponsive even if they were actually working properly. So we have finally retired this. Um, it's a key part of a lot of underlying refactoring work we are doing to add a new flavor of RPC queuing in the Slurm controller. Um, this is something where we are exploring different models to reduce the load on the Slurm control process from RPC storms, both from the compute nodes and from users, and to better and more fairly divvy up the internal time spent holding some of the key central Slurm locks between the different consuming client subsystems uh, and compute nodes versus the users. Um, this is something we're, we're really excited about doing. We're hoping to get some nice performance gains uh, and mostly and most critically eliminate some performance penalties we've taken from other parts of our architecture. 
to that end, uh, there's a lot of internal refactoring supporting this that will be going in, and this will be uh, results of some of that will be in the Slurm 2011 release, um, and some lessons from that may also spill over into the 2108 and future releases as well. And beyond. Um, the beyond is where I can cover stuff that is further out. Um, one thing I will say is that SkedMD as a company, we are always very shy to talk about things that we are working on but have not contractually committed ourselves to doing. Uh, we like to under-promise and over-deliver. Um, so this is a very short, short subset of uh, things that we are discussing and working on because these are the only things that we have contractually promised to do in a future release. There's plenty of other stuff we're obviously working on behind the scenes, uh, but I'm not going to cover those here today. So uh, one thing, and this has been kind of a long requested thing, we are looking at how to expose some in, uh, additional internal scheduling details out, uh, especially so systems administrators building and running reports, trying to model and anticipate different demands on their system, have a little more info to help inform it, as well as to better inform users what's actually happening to their job and specific reasons why their job may be blocked. Um, one of the things that we've talked about, especially uh, over the course of several years, is this idea of an idle node in your cluster is probably not what your users think it is. An idle node is not necessarily idle from the scheduler's perspective. It just means that right now, at this particular point in time, it is not running anything. It may be possible to submit a very short running job that the backfill scheduler will place on that node. But otherwise, um, for any medium to large scale system, there's a very high chance that the main scheduler has a job nominated to run on that in the future and that it is really more of a pre-allocated node. It is idle now so a larger multi-node job can run later. Um, so we do want to look at changing that. We are a little sensitive to people that have built scripts around, especially SQ, uh, potentially breaking those. So we're doing this very carefully and cautiously, but we do want to change that display state to better reflect that that node is going to do something. It is not perfectly idle. You may still be able to fit a backfill job in it if you curtail your time limits appropriately, but we do have a plan to use that node later. Uh, this will also involve some accounting updates to, to better track this. Um, another thing that comes along with some of this work is the idea of exposing the last backfill cycle timestamps per job. Uh, for very large systems with a very diverse workload, the backfill scheduler may not get to the entire queue. It may actually only get to a fraction of the queue on any given backfill cycle. We want to expose that timestamp so admins can better track and manage when that last scheduling pass was. Uh, one other thing that we are working on uh, in conjunction with our hardware partners is support for the HPE Cray Shasta platform. Uh, if you are expecting to run on that system uh, and have not already started discussing some pieces of that with us, I would certainly encourage you to get in touch uh, to talk about how some of that implementation work is going. Uh, and that does it for the roadmap for me. Um, I do want to highlight a couple of upcoming events before I move on to the open Q&A forum. Um, the SC20 virtual conference, uh, Slurm, the Slurm community boff will actually be happening again this year. Uh, we're really pleased that they had selected us from a very large, diverse crowd of boffs. We'll be doing something with a format very similar to how we've been running uh, virtual slug this year. Um, we will give you more details on the timing and how to access this when they are available. Um, they only informed us of, of our acceptance last Wednesday, I believe. Um, so it's still a little new to us as well. This is also usually the point uh, in time at the end of the day where we'd be proud to announce our next destination. Um, unfortunately, we're not prepared to do that just yet. Um, we can't commit to where the next slug is, although we do hope to return to an in-person one for next fall for slug 21. Um, we will certainly be sending out details through Slurm Announce and Slurm User Mailing Lists uh, in the spring uh, when we have them available. Uh, last but not least, GetMD is hiring. Uh, we are always looking for experienced systems programmers and support staff to join our team. Um, our link, getmd.com slash careers, has a bit more detail uh, or email jobs at GetMD uh, or feel free to talk to any of the GetMD staff if you're interested. 
And with that, we are moving on to the open Q&A block. So we have about 20 or so minutes um, that I'm happy to try and cover questions that uh, I may have missed earlier today or other more general questions, um, especially stuff related to roadmap or ideas for things you'd like to see developed. So uh, this is about a five second delay before anyone can possibly hit my screen here. And I'm actually gonna figure out where my hat's hiding, hold on. All right, that better? Okay, um, I'm seeing some comments here about uh, formatting flag to SQ, pre-allocated to SQ. Um, we do want to change it so SQ shows this by default because the users never know to type anything else. Um, promised might be a good name or prep. Uh, prep might be a, an option. We do want to keep the name relatively short. Um, th this is... Uh, one of the hardest parts of my jobs sometimes is actually coming up with good flag names for things. Um, there's always a lot of different options out there with different trade-offs. Um, for example, that's why the magnetic reservations only uh, recently settled on magnetic. Uh, I'm actually about to take the hat off because you can see on the stream that the blue in it does actually interfere with the green screen behind me a little bit. So it's clipping through here. Okay, um, is it possible to reserve a single GPU for debug GPU work? Doesn't seem possible. Um, uh, I think, Chris, this depends a little bit on what release you're running. Um, I thought it was possible in newer ones, but I somebody would have to go double check um, how the reservation logic works. Uh, let's see, I'm seeing a question on, is there a plan for unifying the dozen or so different ways of formatting output? Uh, yes and no. We are slowly trying to converge and be consistent on these, but a lot of what you're seeing in that is the historical legacy of where the different commands came from. Um, sort of in the beginning, um, and you actually see this in the input environment or the input um, options. In the beginning, there was the srun command. The sbatch and salloc command actually descend out of that and thus inherit the majority of the flags that srun can do. Um, although srun does still retain certain flags for job launch that the other commands don't have uh, and vice versa. Um, you see that same pattern play out with the s account tool versus s report tool versus sq. They all derive from sort of different sources. Um, as much as I would love to sort of unify the output for all of these, there's so much external scripting and tooling built around those that we can't radically change the output formatting. Um, so we, we really shy away from making any, any rough adjustments to those. This is one thing though that we are kind of looking forward to of the promise of building the REST API um, is that we have the option there and have been spending a lot of time talking about internally ways to clean up and be more consistent in how that reports a lot of the output. Uh, making that, especially for people building other external tooling, making that a much simpler interface to consume a lot of the Slurm internal details from. Um, so you're not trying to deal with either assembling something like an S account string that reflects exactly what you're looking for, um, or an SQ command with the correct columns that you want, or S control show job, which probably has every single thing you may want, but the format for that is really tricky to parse correctly. So instead, by having a nice convenient way to dump JSON or YAML, that should make it a lot easier to ingest into other tools and provide a standard way for you to manipulate that data, and also something that's not as sensitive to us adding or removing or modifying the format. Uh, trying to catch up here on a few other questions. Um, what is your rationale for this precedence? Note that environment variables will override any options set in a batch script, given that we override on the command line already. So the precedence is certainly a little complicated. Um, 
What's happening here is batch script stuff is parsed, then the environment variables are, are pulled in, uh, and only then are the command line option flags considered. The idea behind this is that the environment variables can be used to adjust and augment the behavior of a given job submission, and that the batch script itself can remain unchanged. Um, I know in practice for a lot of sites, you may prefer that we flip that ordering, but that is not something that, that we are prepared to do at this time. It would impact too many different jobs, uh, too many different workflows. Um, would be nice if the command line flag could be more consistent. Um, Ryan, I certainly agree with you there, but unfortunately we, we have to be very slow and conservative about changing how some of those flags are parsed. We are very good about making sure newer flags are consistent at least, but we do have a lot of baggage there in how that command line API works today. Um, let's see, any plans to create training for intro to Slurm? Um, we don't have any plans to publicize that. Um, SketMD as a company, one of the things that we offer is dedicated training. Um, we don't plan to publish YouTube uh, videos of, of that training format because we like to personalize and customize it to each site. And it's also a key part of how SketMD as a business can continue operations um, and we can continue development of development and support of Slurm. Uh, is SBCast suitable for staging input files? Damien, that is exactly what SBCast was designed to do. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, the SBCast command can send files through Slurm's fanout network out to compute nodes. Um, this can be very helpful and has proven on some very large scale systems to be critical to get jobs to launch in a timely fashion. Um, especially for MPI jobs, if you have a very large binary, um, it may be much, much faster for you to SB cast that binary to local scratch space on the compute nodes rather than have your MPI stack try to open the file off of Luster, for example. Um, if you're starting a 2000 node job, 2000 compute nodes all simultaneously hitting the Luster metadata server for the exact same file tends to cause a lot of problems. Um, and SBCast moving that file from one location, fanning it out through Slurm's communication hierarchy uh, can cut your job launch uh, details down uh, considerably. Uh, da, 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 da. Trying to pick and choose. There's a lot of questions here. Um, I'd like a way to add an acceleration card GPU slash FPGA with auto detect without adding it to the source common GPU and Grez sources. I'd like to just touch the new plugin directory. Um, Daniel, uh, development of those plugins is a little outside of uh, what, what I can concisely answer here. Um, you will certainly need to add uh, your new plugin stuff to the build system. Um, auto reconf is your friend once you do that. Um, I, for the GPU devices in particular, you may need to add a few more enum definitions that correspond to your specific plugin. Um, my best practice for doing that, if you're not prepared to submit something like that upstream, um, would be to certainly keep it on your own local Git branch that you can easily rebase back onto the Slurm source code. Um, especially release to release, a lot of the underlying primitives may shift for you. And this is why we do encourage sites that have built plugins or are thinking of building plugins to look at upstreaming them um, into Slurm so that the maintenance burden moves to us instead of on you and your local administrative staff. Uh, are we considering supporting tasks per Grez? Uh, Bill, yes, at some point we've discussed this. Um, there are some complications in making that truly universal. Um, if that's an issue for your site, uh, feel free to file a ticket um, and we can try and point you at some of the internal discussion. Um, Chris, what version of Slurmer allows GPU reservation? Uh, again, I'm not 100% certain we can do just the GPU reservation that way. Um, I would certainly look at using Slurm 2002, the most recent stable release. Um, we obviously uh, greatly extend and modify stuff every version. Um, if you're having problems with that, um, 
that is something our support group is very good at answering and that I can't think of off the top of my head right now here. Uh, interactive step sounds great. Can the user control on which node the interactive step ends up on based, for example, node features? Um, so by default, that interactive step is going to land on the first of the allocated nodes for that job. There is a uh, seldom used flag that will change that selection criteria. It's called the batch node. Um, I can't remember if it will let you filter on a feature or just specify a specific node that you would like to be the batch host. Um, if you wanted a more uh, detailed syntax for that, that's something we could look at adding in a future release. Um, are there plans to tidy up the documentation based on versions? So the Slurm documentation that you see at slurm.sketmd.com is always for the most recent stable release of Slurm. Um, right now that is Slurm 2002. Uh, and it will say that clearly, um, I believe it's on the left-hand sidebar uh, that this is the Slurm 2002 documentation. Alongside that, we have an archive of the documentation for older Slurm versions, um, so that if your site is still on 1905, you can always point people at the 1905 version of the docs. Um, beyond that, we do spend a lot of time. We have uh, one staff member in particular, Ben, who has spent a lot of time and effort cleaning up the documentation and improving it in each new release as we go forward, and we do expect to continue that. Uh, will Slurm support parent account to allow access to a partition instead of using the sub accounts? Um, so this would be a parent account in your hierarchy built through Slurm DVD and then automatically recursing to all parent descendants. Um, that would be an interesting idea. Uh, it's not something that's on the roadmap right now, but uh, feel free to file a ticket to suggest that. Um, let's see. Every now and again, we have a rogue user causing RPC storms. What impact would it have on config list versus traditional config file setup? Uh, so there, for the config list mode of operation, how this works is the Slurm controller has a new dedicated RPC that it uses to hand the config file off to a user command before the user command comes back and makes the actual RPC they want to make. That is an additional RPC um, if you don't have the configs cached, for example, on the compute nodes. Um, so if they're coming in on a login node and you don't have the config files on the login node, that is a bit of additional RPC handling. However, we have tuned it within the Slurm controller so that the Slurm controller doesn't have to fight over any of the central locks to be able to respond to that RPC request in particular. So it should be able to handle that additional burden. Um, it does not help you with the underlying RPC burden though. Um, one thing, and I don't remember if Jason covered this, um, but one way if you're concerned about the config list mode of operation, putting additional RPC load in from your login nodes, one option is to actually set a Slurm D process up on those login nodes. Just don't put them in any partitions but set them up in your Slurm configuration, run the Slurm D process, and they'll be responsible for keeping a updated cached version of your config available on that login node. Um, and that's also something where longer term, if you're looking at using S cron tab, um, that may actually be convenient to have already deployed. Uh, can I confirm hardware host requirements when the Slurm controller and Slurm DVD run on the same host minimum memory? Um, the memory requirements are not too large at this point compared to most modern systems. Um, 16 gigs and up is certainly plenty for most production workloads. Um, you, we, you will see the memory demand scale with the number of jobs in your system, um, but I don't think you can even buy a server at this point that's not at least 16 gigs of RAM. The things that we do stress are higher clock speed compared to more cores for the CPUs in that system. Uh, due to how some of Slurm's internal locking is handled, Slurm is highly threaded, but it is unfortunately not highly concurrent because a lot of those threads are spending most of their time waiting to grab some of the central locks that let them modify some of the shared data structures. So higher clock speed keeps the 
hot path through all of those locks down to a minimum and improves your overall system performance. Um, sorry, I'm looking for one or two last questions. Unfortunately, I am going to have to wrap this up here in about another minute. I'm um, just cherry picking one or two last ones to answer here. Um, are there plans to allow masking nodes in node lists with a not? Um, we had discussed this and I honestly, let me see if my slide has it. Go back to 2002. I uh, went way too far. Um, we had talked about doing a not syntax, um, but I honestly do not remember if I had implemented that. If, if the not syntax for the node list is relevant for you, please submit a support ticket. Uh, we just can discuss adding that at some point. Um, could I add a flag to reverse the precedence between the environment versus file header settings? I'm sorry, this is a much older question I'm, I'm just catching up to. Um, we do not plan to do that at this point. So the, the environment variable settings, we, we, we suggest using the environment variables very sparsely, especially the environment variable options that change and affect sbatch, srun, and salloc. For the most part, most of what you are probably trying to accomplish through those settings is better done through a CLI filter plugin or a job submit filter. Um, it is probably best not handled through forcing environment variables into your user environment. Um, par, can we temporarily disable S cron tab jobs? Like for normal crop, you could, cron, you could just stop uh, cron D. Uh, par, the best way to do that would be to have a dedicated partition for these cron jobs and then just drain the uh, drain the partition um, so that you could stop any further runs of those jobs. Um, and let's see, one question from Matt. Any follow-ups on the containerization discussion from last year? Um, we are still working with a lot of different groups on aspects of containers within Slurm, um, but I do not have anything to, to publicly discuss at this time, unfortunately. Um, so with that, uh, I am going to have to wrap things up for today. Um, I do want to thank you guys uh, for coming to Virtual Slug. Uh, I hope this has all been useful for you. Um, this is certainly a novel experience for us um, and not necessarily something we would have tried otherwise, but it, it looks like it's been fairly well attended. I want to thank you guys all for your patience uh, sitting here watching these. Uh, the live streams, uh, the, the video recorded version of all this will be online for at least another week here. Um, the slides behind each of the presentations we will have on our usual publication archive um, in the next day or two uh, as I get a chance to post them. So thank you guys all again uh, for joining here. Um, thank you to the larger, broader Slurm community, especially those that are trying to help out each other and answer questions in the chat today. Um, thank you all for your time and attention. And with that, have a good afternoon, folks.